So ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be joining you today. Uh, I am grateful for the technology that allows me to be with you, and to Hilda and to the others who have devoted their time to making this possible. You should have a handout with uh, one page with Rabbi Jonathan Apeshitz and Moravian Christianity at the top. Uh, I am, as you will quickly discover, if you don't know already, a raw newcomer to your field of expertise I'm here because I believe I can shed some observations from my own field, Jewish mysticism and messianism, that may shed light on dark places in yours. I hope for your expert judgment as to what substance there may be to the suggestions I will make today. And I think uh, I, I was fascinated by both of these uh, talks. And I think, Julie, particularly, I would be interested in hearing whether your work uh, does anything to either confirm or contradict uh, some of the suggestions I make. You may be familiar with the name of Shabbatai Tzvi or Sabbatai Zevi. Either pronunciation seems to me fine. And you, now you certainly are familiar with it, the name. A Jew from Izmir who became an international celebrity in 1665 with his claim to be the Messiah and then converted to Islam the following year. His apostasy marked the end of Sabbateanism as a popular messianic movement, but also the beginning of its new life as an underground sect, scorned but also dreaded, often persecuted by the Jewish authorities. This sect used the Jewish mystical theosophy of Kabbalah to justify the paradox of an apostate messiah, and in the process brought out aspects of Judaism few could have guessed were latent within it. Very little of its literature has been translated into English or any other European language. I've been working on a series of translations to fill this gap. The latest Sabbatean text to which I've applied myself is a Hebrew Kabbalistic work entitled, and this will be on your handout, Va'avo Hayom El Ha'ayin, I Came This Day to the Spring. I'll refer to it as Va'avo Hayom. This document created a scandal among the Jewish communities of Central Europe when it surfaced in manuscript in 1725, and no wonder. Its wildly unorthodox theology is conveyed with ex equally wild sexual imagery rooted in traditional Kabbalistic eroticism, but carried to extremes that have led modern scholars to label the book as pornographic. Its earliest readers, as Pavel Macieko has pointed out, had no idea what to make of it. Although obviously Sabbatean, it didn't read like any Sabbatean propaganda they'd ever seen. The best they could do was compare it with the doctrines of the ancient pagans. I myself believe Ba'avo Hayom to have been intended as a charter for the world religion of the future, rooted in Kabbalistic Judaism, but unlike any religion ever known. The book is profoundly engaged with Christianity, which it treats as in some respects superior to Judaism. Although it circulated anonymously, rumor claimed it to be the work of Rabbi Jonathan Ibeshitz, then not quite 30, and the rising star of the yeshiva of Prague, destined to become the foremost rabbinic scholar and preacher of Central Europe. The consensus of modern scholarship is that the rumor was true. Ibeshitz was indeed the author of Va'avo Hayom, a secret Sabbatean in the very heart of 18th century rabbinic orthodoxy. It would be impossible here to give a full description of the Kabbalistic mysticism that pervades Va'avo Hayom. One of its central concerns is the problem of how an infinite and perfect deity can have generated a finite and imperfect world 
the problem is solved by generating a string of divine potentialities that fill the gap, mediating between the absolute unity of God and the tangible multiplicity of the material universe. The resulting system features a pantheon of divine entities, some male, some female, some both or neither, all of the manifestations of the one. The interactions among these entities, their conflicts and couplings, is the esoteric narrative of the Holy Scriptures. If Ba'avohayom proclaims a new and unheard of faith, what are its tenets? First, the brotherhood of all humanity, equal sharers in divine love. Second, what we now call gender equality, as mirrored in the relations among the male and female manifestations of divinity. For centuries, Kabbalah had proclaimed a female aspect to divinity, but subordinated it to the male. Va'avo Hayom looks forward to a golden future in which the female partner is figuratively as well as literally on top. Third, what we might call marriage equality. Homosexual love is treated as a legitimate form of eroticism, warranting the same respect and acceptance as heterosexual. Ba'avo Hayom celebrates the transition of humanity from its dependence on the inferior but fully legitimate divine manifestation called the God of Israel to the loftier, holy, ancient one, representative of the Christian dispensation, lover of the nations, Deuteronomy 33.3. This ancient Holy One embodies an absolute undiluted grace that once devastated the universe and would do so again. This is why the God of Israel and his Judaism, balancing grace and judgment, needed to intervene. Had not Shabbatai Tzvi, through his apostasy, absorbed the destructive energies of that grace and thus enabled humanity to bear it. So Christianity, after a long interval during which Judaism was a necessary stopgap, at last triumphs. Only a Christianity made viable by Shabbatai Tzvi is no longer Christianity, but something new, the religion of the eschaton that is breaking upon us, that this was the youthful doctrine of the leading rabbi of his time, which in later years he seems never to have repudiated, surely counts as one of the most extraordinary phenomena in the history of religion. The Avoha Yom's positive theological engagement with Christianity implies per positive personal association with Christians on the part of its author. This would well suit Jonathan Eibschitz. All his life, Eibschitz was on terms of friendship, cooperation, and mutual respect with Christian scholars and religious leaders. According to Pavel Macieko, Lutheran missionaries from Halle who met Eibschitz reported that he had studied the writings of the radical pietist and member of the Moravian brethren, Johann Christian Edelmann, and that he expounded Lutheran theology to the students at his yeshiva. This testimony to a Moravian link is not surprising, given that much in Ba'avo Hayom is reminiscent of the radical Moravian theology conventionally associated with the sifting time of the 1740s. Bahavo Hayom's sacralization of sex and the embarrassing frankness with which the divine sexuality is detailed has its parallel in what Craig Atwood calls the rare example of sexualized spirituality in Christianity formulated by Count von Sinzendorf. With Christ's incarnation, Sinzendorf taught the genital organs were no longer pudenda, things of shame, but verenda, things to be reverenced. Ba'avo Hayom's elevation of the Shekhinah 
the female aspect of the deity is suggestive of the Moravian understanding of the Holy Spirit as the mother within the Trinity and the development of ceremonies and liturgies in her honor. Va'avohayom recognizes homosexuality as a legitimate and indeed divine form of sexual expression, its human manifestations validated by Shabbatai Tzvi. Paul Puiker has shown that the religious imagery of 18th century Moravianism is saturated with homoeroticism, which may at times, so the Moravians' enemies charge, not without reason, have been translated into actual behavior. Will a Moravian connection help us understand a particularly strange passage in Va'avo Hayom, describing the God of Israel as recipient of anal sex with a higher divine potentiality called the root? The God of Israel, prefigured in the biblical Adam, must, after his misstep in the Garden of Eden, be ensheathed in a garment, sometimes of skin, Genesis 3.21, sometimes of light that shields him from the forces of chaos. When he makes love with his female partner, the Shekhinah, he rolls back his, the skin from his penis. But when he takes the female role, vis-a-vis -vis the root, and here is the quotation on your handout, he must divest himself of this skin. And this is the meaning of, I have stripped off my garment. Song of Songs 5.3, spoken by the female partner. At times, however, the skin cannot be removed. And in this event, what the root does is make a wound, a perforation in the skin. And afterward, he copulates, which is, as I have written above, the significance of the verse, what are these wounds? Zechariah 13, 6, where the question, what are these wounds between your arms, is answered, it is where I was bruised in the house of my lovers. It is also the meaning of the words spoken by Job 19, 6, under my skin this one would knock, meaning that Job, symbolic of the God of Israel, got a knocking in the sexual sense underneath the skin. Freely he multiplies my wounds, Job 9.17. Freely, unrestrained by the commandments, for in the higher realms the commandments are not binding. I have never seen anything like this in any Jewish source, Kabbalistic or non-Kabbalistic, Sabbatean or non-Sabbatean. It suggests to me the contemporary Moravians' veneration of the vagina-like wounds of Christ inflicted by the phallic sphere. For Zinzendorf, Jesus Christ was the Old Testament God, the God of Israel, the Creator. Ba'avo Hayom similarly identifies the God of Israel with the Son. The transfer of Moravian wounds theology from Christ to the God of Israel, which I suppose to underlie the passage I've quoted, is thus completely comprehensible. So far, there seems to be a case for Moravian influence on Ibishitz and his Va'avo Hayom. The chronology, however, is wrong. At least conventionally, the Moravian theology of the mid-18th century is understood as deriving from a synergy between Sinzendorf and the Moravian refugees whom he allowed to settle on his estate in Saxony in 1722, the lion's share of the creativity being credited to Sinzendorf. The manuscript of Avo Hayom came to light in 1725, a mere three years later. Sinsendorf's theology, like the Kabbalistic system found in Ba'avo Hayom, must have taken years to gestate. There seems no way the former can reasonably suppose, be supposed to have influenced the latter. I see three possible resolutions. First, we might decide that the parallels between Moravian teachings and practice and, and Va'avo Hayom are too general 
to sustain any hypothesis of direct influence. At most, they point to elements of a shared zeitgeist. Second, we might reverse the direction of influence and suppose that Zinzendorf and his followers drew some of their key ideas from Shabbatian Judaism. Yet the wounds of a divine being are natural and understandable in a Christian context. In a Jewish framework, they stick out as alien and bizarre. If there was indeed borrowing, it makes best sense to suppose that Moravian Christianity was the source. Third, might we suppose that Ibishis, who spent his most impressionable years in Moravia, there came into contact with underground cells of Protestants who had already evolved beliefs and practices and rhetorical tropes normally associated with Zinzendorf and the Herrenhut community. This will imply that 1722 is not quite the watershed it seems, that Zinzendorf learned at least as much from his Moravian guests as he taught them and that the designation of the developing faith as Moravian is no misnomer. Atwood notes that for Zinzendorf's 16th birthday in 1716, his grandmother minted a medallion showing, quote, Jesus wearing the crown of thorns with the inscription, Vulnera Christi, the wounds of Christ. The other side depicted a man carrying a cross under the words Nostra Medela, our healing. Something like a wounds theology was known in Zinzendorf's family well before 1722. Where did they learn it? Perhaps from crypto-Protestants in Moravia, such as those targeted in the draconian Habsburg imperial decrees of the 1720s? The chronology of Ibishis's early life is uncertain. The one solid date is November 7, 1707, when his father died one year after taking up the position of rabbi in the Moravian town of Ivanchice, leaving Jonathan an orphan. The boy seems to have been 12 years old, precociously brilliant. Ivanchice, from whose German name Ivanchice, Jonathan took his own, had been in the 16th century a center of the Czech brethren. Is it far-fetched to suppose that remnants of the old faith hung on in secret, taking new forms long after the defeat at the White Mountain in 1620 and the religious repression that followed, or that an inquisitive young rabbi's son might have found a way to make contact with the preservers of the flame? Ibishis left Ivan, she says, shortly after his father's death. He stayed briefly in Prosnitz and Hölleschau in Moravia and married at age 15, spent two years in Mlada Boleslav in Bohemia as head of the yeshiva. Mlada Boleslav had been a particularly important center for the 16th century brethren. Might Ibishitz there have renewed his contacts begun in Ivanchitze with their underground religion? I can only imagine the seismic effect on young Jonathan of the discovery that Christianity wasn't a monolithic oppressor, that it had its own repressed and persecuted with whom a sensitive Jewish adolescent could sympathize. If he'd already begun to identify with the Sabbateans, minority within a minority, forced into secrecy by official intolerance, this would have intensified his sense that the crypto-Protestants of the Habsburg lands were brothers under the skin and his consequent receptivity to their ideas. If these conjectures should be correct, or at least plausible, a question I submit for your informed judgment, then a ray of light is shed from an unexpected source into the time of the hidden sea, the dark and mysterious decades preceding the 18th century blossoming of Moravian Christianity. Thank you. Thank you very much.